Hello and welcome to the RCB podcast powered by Kotak Mahindra Bank. You know, if you build trust in, in players, um, that they can have those honest conversations with each other as well. I think we've got a, a group that a lot of the learning happens off the park just in the informal chats that the guys are having. So if you can help build that environment where it's a learning environment, but not always a, not a coaching environment, so that the, the subtle conversations that are happening all around us are probably the most valuable. And they only happen when people aren't constantly worried about their own spot or, or worried about themselves. They're more willing to give to the team. And I think that's where you can gain an advantage. This is my driver's license, my metro card, and this is my fan card! Hello and welcome to the RCB Podcast. My name is Danesh and with me, Mike Hessen. Mike, I'm going to begin by asking you the theme of this show, which also happens to be the first question. How has the IPL changed your life? Well, it certainly kept me in the game in terms of um, being able to, I guess, have an influence over a different group of players. Um, I guess I've been lucky enough to stay in the game for a long time, play in different countries, but the, the passion, uh, it just keeps you, it keeps you young in terms of being involved in the IPL. Uh, you turn up every day, you love the game, uh, you love the impact that it has on the people around you, uh, both in the playing group and the supporters. So it just, it keeps me, um, you know, hugely motivated to stay involved in cricket. Um, Mike, what is it like uh, growing up in New Zealand? Yeah, my mother um, had a big Im- impact. I mean, I grew up, um, spent a lot of time uh, in the in the country. Um, you know, we would holiday and things like that. So, um, you know, my parents split when I was young. Uh, so obviously spent an even amount of time between the two. Um, but I just really vividly remember those, um, the sort of holiday periods where, you know, you, basically your parents want you to go away. <laughs> So you basically, I went and played cricket and uh, they just encouraged me to sort of live my dreams and go and, um, yeah, basically follow my passion, which was always always cricket. Um, my mother was a management consultant. She was a very smart woman and, and always sort of challenged my thinking and um, and probably challenged me along the way to make sure that, uh, you know, there's more than one way to solve a problem. And I think as a cricket coach and as a cricket player, um, you're always trying to solve problems, um, you know, out in the middle, um, off the park, whatever, and, and you're trying to pass that on to players as well so that they can um, solve puzzles out in the middle. So, yeah, that was a big influence my mother had. My brother um, was bigger than me. He was a year and a half older, so I always had to play against him and all his um, all his mates in, in all sports. But um, it certainly taught me to stand up for myself. Um, he was about a foot taller than me, um, which isn't that difficult because I'm not very big, but he was a guy that I needed to... I needed to front up to, and if I was able to perform against him, then I gave myself a good chance. So it was a good lesson. Did you grow up in one of the big cities in New Zealand, or was it a small town? Well, it's the fourth biggest, but there's about 120,000 people, so it's pretty small. Um, you know, compared to India, it's a village. Um, but it was a, it's a, it's a town that that loves its sport um, and really passionate about its sport. So certainly grew up in that, but it was an easy city. So be able to get from place A to B, to get to practice, to get to trainings um, was easy. So I guess, you know, growing up loving sport uh, was a nice place to be. You've coached teams like uh, Kenya and Argentina. And I mean, these are places where they don't play a lot of cricket. So what was it like to coach them and be in that environment with them? It was, for me, it was about um, taking myself out of my comfort zone. Like I'd coached Otago and, and been in, in the, my area for uh, 10 to 12 years uh, and coaching professionally, but you know I could have stayed there forever, um, and I and I would have done a decent job. And but I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to um, to go to a different country, uh, learn a different language, um, understand a different culture in terms of how they operate in cricket. Um, you know, Argentina was about trying to find a, a way. You know, that the facilities they had weren't fantastic, um, but we had to find a way of being able to compete with you know USA, Bahamas. Canada, Bermuda, you know, some some nations who had a, a bigger cricket background than potentially Argentina and be competitive. So we had to be creative and, and I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the lifestyle. Um, and as I said, just taking you out of your comfort zone. 
So you, you lived in Buenos Aires? Yeah, you? lived in Buenos Aires. So we lived in a place called Recoleta, which was um, where Eva Peron's grave is. So it's quite a, a touristy area. We had like an armed guard on every corner because there was a lot of kidnappings and stuff um, around that time. So uh, I didn't have my children with me at that time. I was just relatively recently married. Um, and as we would train late at night um, at sort of, you know, there'd be these clubs where there'd be rugby fields, polo grounds, and the odd cricket net in the corner. Um, and you just have to find a way, you know, guys would come to training at 10 o'clock at night, you'd train till midnight, um, find a way to get home, like you just, you, you couldn't pull everyone together for a team training because it was such a vast city, you just couldn't get people in one place, so uh, you certainly had to be unique in terms of how you how you operated, And but a really passionate bunch of cricketers and, you know, we were able to achieve some pretty cool things. It's easy in a country like India where you can just say, hey, I'm a cricket coach, and they get it. In Argentina, a, you got to explain cricket. B, explain what a cricket coach does. Did you ever run into a situation like that where you were like, how do I tell this guy what I do? I mean... Definitely. I mean, they thought croquet for a start. Um, polo was a big game over there. So they were, you know, cricket, um, but there were bilingual schools. There were little pockets of, of bilingual schools where cricket was had a big influence. Um, but there was a pretty small player base. But yeah, it's not like you'd you turn up to the local coffee shop and they'd know who you were. You know, no idea, let alone if they asked and you told them. So, uh, once again, that was unique as well. You know, you were you were a nobody in the middle of a, a big city um, trying to do something for a national team and trying to achieve some special things. And as I said, there were some really you know some good friendships that I've still got now um, from that group of players. You were stopped at gunpoint in Kenya. Yep. What happened? Tell us that story. I think it was day two actually in Kenya, um, in Nairobi, uh, first day driving actually, and tried to get to a cricket game to watch some people play. And um, I was at a roundabout and uh, I looked up and there was a, a machine gun pointing at me through the window. Um, it was a police officer. Um, and he said that I didn't indicate or something at the roundabout and I'm in big trouble. So he's basically said he wants to jump in the car and. Um, take me to the police station so I was you know I was shaking at this stage um, so yeah he jumped out well he's popped along to the passenger side pointed the gun at me and told me to open the door so I opened the door um, and he sat down had the gun sort of pointing at me and directed me towards the police station and this yeah, as I said bearing in mind this was I think day two uh, my family hadn't left New Zealand yet uh, and yeah it became pretty apparent that obviously he was after some some form of money um, to make it go away. So we pulled over and managed to come to an arrangement and uh, then he jumped out of the car and wandered back to the, the roundabout and probably found the next person. So it was a pretty harrowing um, experience. I mean, I turned up to the cricket ground and uh, some of the administrators were saying, oh, you shouldn't let them into your car. It's like, mate, he's pointing a gun at me. What am I supposed to do? So look, it was a tough start, but certainly got better. Um, yeah. And once again, some really good people in Kenya and some, you know, that's, unfortunately those things can happen anywhere um, in a big city, but once again, really enjoyed the playing group. Um, as said, still got some good mates now and um, yeah, we managed to win a few games of cricket along the way, so it was nice. Uh, Mike, you've done uh, so many jobs in this game, right? You've played the game, you've done commentary, you've done coaching and you've been the head of cricket operations which job do you enjoy the most I thought about that um, I thought about that before I actually really enjoy the combination of the job because you you know I love coaching and, and to be fair I've always been a cricket coach um, from the time I started uh, doing it I'll say part-time I was a I was a player coach and the coaching was secondary it was definitely secondary but I just love um, seeing players succeed and and uh, I love the joy that they get from it um, and you know I love the fact that you know you can potentially have a bit of an influence over somebody's career in, in a positive way so I get a lot of satisfaction from that and coaching um, my own country coaching New Zealand was you know was the pinnacle for me in terms of coaching New Zealand at a World Cup um, at home in front of your home fans so that, that was huge and and that had a an ongoing um, result in terms of you know, a lot more playing numbers played the game in, in New Zealand. So, you know, there was a real succession plan to that. So I got a lot of satisfaction from that. Um, then went into commentary and, and I, it's quite nice looking at, at a game objectively, yeah. you know, rather than just looking at it from one side and, and 
So the commentary is quite, it's quite fun. And you, you actually sleep way better at night doing commentary. You know, when you're coaching or you're you know, involved in this role with RCB, director of cricket, you know, you, you live every ball and you're always trying to think and trying to find a point of difference and how you can gain a, an advantage. Whereas with commentary, you know, you do your research, but then you, you go to sleep, you go, you do your job and you go home and you just relax. It's actually quite a nice place to be. So when did the switch flip? When did you just decide that, okay, fine, I'm done with playing cricket. Now I'm going to change careers. When did that happen? It kind of happened um, by mistake, really. So I was a, a player coach in England. Um, I had two or three really good seasons as a player. Came back home to New Zealand and, and was offered um, director of cricket role at Otago Cricket, um, which was one of the six major associations in New Zealand. Okay. Um, and I was probably 20 years younger than the other five. So I was literally 21. I was still very much a player, had coached for a while and got a great opportunity. So. I needed to make a decision and it was a pretty tough one to be honest because I still had ambition as a player um, but I guess in the end you know New Ze cricket at the time wasn't really a profession in New Zealand um, and being I had just bought a house having come back from England with a little bit of money um, and I needed to pay my mortgage and I was offered this great opportunity and in the end it's probably a, a good thing. Yeah it doesn't matter which part of the world you're from when the EMIs are thrown in front of you <laughs> you Get the job done yeah, and pay cool, that. Eh? Got to. Uh, Mike, what's the biggest mistake you think you've done in your cricket career? Um, uh, I'd like to know that and I'd like to know the one thing that you're extremely proud of. Yeah, that's a tough one. Can I come back to that one? Sort of got to line them up, hey? What was my biggest mistake? My, my most satisfaction was definitely um, the World Cup in 2015. Yeah. Um, having gone through unbeaten, um, first time New Zealand's ever made a final um, of any world event and it was on the back of, of, a, of a pretty ordinary period prior to that um, so and as I said I think the fact that the whole it galvanized the whole country the whole country got behind New Zealand and it, it's had some some succession following that as well which is probably the most satisfying thing it was a really tough job to start with and um, you know you probably go back to your your first part of the question that I tried to ignore, but um, there was a really tough start to that job in 2012. Um, I came into a team that was eighth, eighth and ninth in the world and, uh, you know, needed to make some changes there and, and you know, made a pretty public one in terms of, of changing the captain. Um, and it wasn't very popular with a lot of people. Um, and it was probably, that was probably the hardest decision to make um, I think at the time, the easiest decision was probably to do nothing, and but it wasn't the right decision. Yeah. <laughs> and but it would have made my life a heck of a lot less stressful um, for the next 12 months. So, but I I guess you you stick with your gut as a cricket coach, and you go look. If I'm going to get fired, which will happen at some stage, I may as well do it the way that I think it needs to be done and take ownership of it, rather than is I can hang on to my job for another year or two. Yeah, that was the tough decision that I made in terms of changing the captain um, and then made Brendan McCullum captain. Um, and, you know, in the end, the rest is history. You know, it was the right thing to do, but it was certainly a pretty challenging time. But, but don't you spend most of your life between straddling between doing the right thing and doing the good thing? How do you choose what's better to do? Well, I think you've, for me, it all goes back to the team. Like if, if you line it up, it's really simple for me. Um, the decision I make, is it in the best interest of the team? And if the answer is yes, then I'm gonna do it. Mm. If it's not in the best interest of me, that, that's okay. Mm. But if, if I think that's in the best interest of the team, I will always back that decision. Mm. And therefore, hand on heart, I can say, look, um, I've done this job in the best interest of the, the people that employ me in the best interest of the team. Because I, I guess I ask a lot of players as well to do the same in terms of play in a selfless way and play in a way that um, thinks about the team first. And in many times that's not in your own individual best interests. Yeah. So as a coach, you, you can't ask that of others and then try and look after yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's the way I try and live my life, I guess. Yeha mera driver's license, my metro car, or yeha mera fan card.
uh, Mike, what did you know of RCB before you joined? And uh, now that you're here, how much of that impression has changed? I think the initial impression was, you know, a hugely talented group of players, um, a lot of stars, um, you know, a huge fan base. Um, having been to Chinnaswamy, a passionate fan base, uh, but probably a team that was pretty inconsistent in terms of performance, probably relied on, you know, one or two key players in terms of stars. Um, and I think since I've arrived, uh, I've really understood that it's, it's a lot more inclusive than that. It's a, you know, the franchise is more than, um, you know, it, it's sure it's driven and its identity is around Virat and, and AB's obviously had a huge influence, but there are so many other parts to the business in terms of how we can grow and be consistent at RCB in so many different ways. Um, so I, I guess I really enjoy the fact that it's a professional outfit. It's run by a, by a business administration, so it's not a motive. Um, and I think a lot of teams and franchises can often be run by emotion. Yeah. And, you know, the way you get consistency of performance, um, the way I believe it is you, you provide that stable platform outside of the park. And if you can do that, that certainly allows players to be more consistent on the park. And, and that's something that, that I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, Mike, um, what's a typical day like in your life at RCB? Give us a view of your day. What happens? Uh, yeah, get up pretty early in the morning, um, get through all my emails, make sure nothing's happened overnight that I'm unaware of. I mean, when you've got a group of you know, close to 100 people, um, there are often things that happen overnight that you need to deal with straight away. Um, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, it could be a player, is, it could be an injury that's happened overnight, it could be a family matter, it could be anything that's affecting the group. So it's making sure that those are put to one side. Um, I try and get to the gym pretty early just to clear the head, do a little bit of exercise um, yeah. before having a, you know, basically having a, a quick breakfast. And that time's probably a chance to catch up with a, a few group of well, the early birds, I guess, yeah. the ones that go to breakfast early. Um, and I guess keep your finger on the pulse so that you know what's happening within the group. Um, you know, and, and if you can help in any way, then you, you do that. Um, then it's going back and analyzing the game that happened the night before. So. You know, we've got a lot of video footage to go through, um, looking at all the data that would have been sent um, heading into the next match. So making sure that um, we're, we're ahead of the game in terms of where are those potential opportunities where we can gain an advantage. Um, so it's it's not just looking at the, the numbers that everybody else looks at, it's trying to dig a little bit deeper in terms of how can we structure the way we operate to gain an advantage. So often spend a bit of time doing that. Um, get the coaches together um, you know in this role now is um, taking on the coaching role it's more short-term focused yeah. um, so short term is getting the coaches together making sure we're well planned for practice getting their thoughts around um, the team so that when I meet with uh, with the skipper later on I've you know I've, I've pulled a number of different ideas and then obviously go along with you know with my own as well or a, a you know a combined approach um, so once we've sort of done that, then it's more about that medium to longer term view. Um, you know, with, with someone like Marlo around our scouting program, you know, at the moment, there'll be domestic cricket happening in India. So making sure that we're we're planned and our scouts are going in the right place. So uh, Marlo Land will have that most of that in place. It's just a matter of talking to him about that and making sure that's ticked off. Um, yeah, and, and then you sort of get ready for the day, you know, your meetings. So you've got your team meetings um, and then yeah, start to prepare for the next day. Maybe some one-on-ones with players that, you know, just want to chat. Um, often the ones that aren't playing are the ones that that want a little bit more time, um, and understandably so. You know, they're desperate to play, so just trying to give them a way forward in terms of how they can keep evolving their game. Um, but look, to be fair, you, it's it's just busy. You know, there's just things to do. It's not, you know, none of them are particularly onerous they just you just move from one thing to the next and, and try and be honest with players and um, we you know you, you don't want to you don't want to fudge players with with expectations that are unrealistic but you also want them to be motivated to keep improving because we will need them at some stage so um, yeah it's, it's good fun.
you know, I'm sure there are so many people watching this right now or listening to it and thinking, man, how do you really go coach a Virat Kohli or an A.B. De Villiers? They know what to do. I know that being the coach of such a big franchise is very different from being a coach at, say, a school level where you literally tell the person where to keep the bat and where to keep, you know, how to hold the ball. What exactly does a coach in such a big system do? Well, I think you, even if you had these players all year round, um, it's very much question based. But I guess when you're in competition phase, which is, you know, it's not like we have a huge build up. So when you're straight in competition, the last thing you want to do is create uncertainty around techniques or anything like that. So uh, most of our coaching or, or discussions are just, if you see something that's maybe not quite right, um, you just observe for a while and, and then you ask questions because these players are great for a reason and they've probably had 10, 20, 30 different coaches throughout their life that yeah. have all offered different bits of advice. So they've arrived at this point in time with loads of information and they've obviously gone down this path for a reason. So rather than feeling like I have the right to come in and, and make a judgment on their game and question it, I just ask questions in terms of what are you working on? What are some of the key things that you want us to keep an eye on? Um, how do you like that feedback? You know, do you like it at the time? Do you like it in video format? Do you like to chat afterwards? Because um, ultimately they have the answers, <laughs> but they can't watch themselves at the time, you know. Yeah. They might be kinesthetic learners, so they might just need to feel it. Um, they might need to see it. They might need somebody to tell them. Um, so it's just wor working out how that player receives information and, and how you can add value. Certainly not how you can teach them how to bat, that's the last thing you're gonna do, but um, it's just how you can find a way to add value to what they already know. Mike, it's easier to manage people versus managing egos. Uh, how much of your day goes in managing either? I, I think it's actually understanding the person. And I think if you spend the time trying to understand the motivation and the motives behind people. Yeah. You know, people interpret that as ego, but I think it's often just a misinterpretation of a conflict between, you know, the, the player not thinking that, that you genuinely respect them and what they're going through. Uh, whereas I spend time just trying to get to know players and understand them, not so that I can manipulate them, just so that I understand what motivates them and how we can work together to for the betterment of the team. Um, and to be fair, every player I've worked with, you know, is hugely passionate about the team doing well. And often the perception from outside is so far removed from reality. You know, people think that, you know, this guy has a big ego or whatever. No, not at all. He's just slightly different. And every cricket team is made up of a whole bit different people. Otherwise, it'd be pretty boring. I mean, we're lucky enough to have blokes like you in our, within our midst that it's a little yeah. bit different as well. And, and like everybody's different and that's what makes the group when you're together so cool yeah. you know you've got diversity I, I remember you called us in the first year you joined and uh, you said uh, the uh, I said yes so what's what do you want to talk to us about and you said I want you to keep your emotions stable there should not I should never see a fluctuation they can't be too happy too sad you just got to stay normal why did you pick us out and why did you say that to us well, I'll go back to that, I guess, that stable platform. And I think that, you know, the, the mantra that keeps coming out where people talk about, oh, the team's not consistent or whatever, like often that can be driven or helped by everybody around them in terms of having that stable platform. So if, what I mean by that is, is if, if we win, everybody's happy and like running around and dancing and, you know, the music's up loud and whatever. And then when we lose, it's somber, then, Everything is driven by the outcome. And for us to be a, a successful team, it's more about the process and the way we go about things being really consistent. And sometimes we will lose and actually play well. And there are other times we win and we actually haven't played that well at all. Yeah. So, and I, I believe pretty strongly that if we can all have that mantra, every game we go into, we are hugely professional in terms of how we operate. We absolutely give it everything in terms of preparation, performance, and then after that, it's okay. Like the result will be the result. Um, and I guess that it also hopefully makes yourself and, and everybody else in the support staff feel like we are all in this together. Yeah. 
you know, it's not a, it's not a them and us. It's like we actually can all have a really positive impact on the outcome. Um, and we don't want you to be boring. Like, I'm, I'm a boring bloke. I, I accept that. Generally, pretty boring. No, not really, but no, no. but but I'm not a, I'm not a life of the party sort of guy. Yeah. But I love being around people that are. I mean, you're a life in the party. Yeah, yeah. I, I love being there, and I love being around people that are vibrant and bring a real enthusiasm to the group yeah. and I love just sitting there and soaking that up but that's not me but I, I love people being themselves so I hope that um, you know when I talk to people about trying to be consistent it's consistent within their own boundaries <laughs> if you know what I mean it's not I don't want you to be like me yeah. and you know I shouldn't be like you yeah so if we can be ourselves then we'll be we'll be just fine um, have you ever run into a situation where you've had to sit down with someone and um go through this process and it's helped them uh, in the next game? Oh, look, look, I think so. Um, and yeah, look, look, it has um, on many occasions, but it's, I'm only sort of a piece of the puzzle. I think it would be a bit arrogant to say, yeah, I told Verrett to pick the bat up this way and he got a hundred and geez, how good am I? Like, I don't think that's ever the way. And I think, yeah, I probably wouldn't tell you about something like that anyway, but um, I think it's just the the discussions that you have with players, like like Yuzi Yuzvendra Chahal, yeah. for example. We know that he had a really tough time um, in the UAE. We know he's he's had a wasn't selected for India, and that's challenging for a guy that's that good and been that good for a long time. So, for me, it's just sitting down and understanding him and saying, look, how do you bowl your best? What's what are some of the things you do when you bowl your best? Okay, great. Now, how can we get you back to that point? Um, how can we measure it? You know, how can we, rather than just looking at the, the numbers, how can we judge your performance? Because sometimes the ball comes out beautifully and as I said, someone just plays really well. So he, he, can't, he can't beat himself up over that. He can only control how it comes out, where it lands and those sort of things. So, you know, we spend a lot of time going, well, okay, where are the lengths that we want you to bowl? Okay, in terms of you're successful in this area. So rather than worrying about the wickets, why don't we just judge you on terms of how many balls you can land in that particular length? And then at the end of the game, if you haven't got two or three wickets, then we can review that. But I think you're more likely to get two or three wickets by just doing some of those fundamentals really well. And we had a bit of a discussion around it. And um, in the end, we agreed that we'd give it a go for a game or two. And um, that was his decision ultimately, because he's got to he's got to bowl the ball. Um, and then he's gone out against Mumbai, um, and he's he's bowled beautiful length, and he's managed to get some rewards, which was really pleasing. Because if he didn't, I probably would have had to try and convince him another way. But I think the fact that he he bowled the way that he bowls really well, and he got some rewards, was just a and you could see the joy in his face and the joy in his teammates was a really nice coaching moment. Um, and it wasn't just me, I'm Sri Ram, bowling coach, have been saying probably exactly the same thing, but it's just nice when a player buys into something, commits to doing something, and then it comes off pretty well. So, Mike, there's players like Devdat, Shahbaz, Harshal. Uh, a, how do we find this amazing talent? B, how do you quantify it and say, this is all this person's worth at the auction is if we don't get it in this amount we move on to the next person yeah it's a good question i mean someone like dev obviously he was in the rcb squad didn't get any opportunities um i saw him bad in the um kpl yeah. um when i was doing some commentary he batted in the middle order he bet up and down but he 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 showed some skills that nobody else in that tournament showed and it wasn't necessarily through volume of runs he he played the better bowl as well. He had time, the way he timed the ball. Um, so it was basic. It was a pretty easy decision. Um, he also started to score a lot of runs domestically. So it was an easy decision in terms of look, this guy's from Karnataka. He's he's a high quality player. He's we either give him an opportunity now and give him a load of opportunity, or we we're just going to stunt his growth. So it was a, it was a pretty easy decision. And once again, the fact he got 50 odd in the first game. Um, meant that it was so much easier to give him a load of opportunities. You know, we pretty much said we were going to play him in every game anyway. Um, but he started to believe as well. Um, so that was pretty easy. Harshal was more a, 
um, we needed that type of bowler in our system. Um, someone who had good changes of pace. We had Saini, we had Siraj, who were, we had Umesh at the time. We had plenty of guys who could bowl pace, but we needed um, somebody that could bring a point of difference. Um, so we went pretty hard to Delhi to try and get that trade. Um, didn't play a lot of cricket at Delhi, um, but it actually, his role fitted what we required. Um, you know, just to complement the other bowlers that we already had. So that was, you know, we obviously had a price point around what we are willing to pay then. Um, I, I guess when you go into an auction, you, your tipping point is, if we keep going harder here, is it going to have an impact on the rest of the auction? And what I tend to do is I tend to bracket players. So the reality is some players will be paid more than they're worth and some will be paid less. But if you get the combination of the two, on budget that's okay <laughs> so we tend to put guys in little brackets in terms of if we get those two guys for that price point then we're it has no impact over the rest of our auction and whether as I said somebody gets paid three four crore over budget they're just lucky <laughs> on that day and the guy who we get a bit cheaper is just you know we're fortunate to get him a bit cheaper um, he's probably worth more for us but as a package we get what we get so that's the way I tend to look at it. And and what do you do when you don't get a player? So, you know, the player crosses that bracket that you've drawn around him, then what happens? Yeah. Well, we have a decision tree. So for every position, we have a, you know, we have a pecking order and we go, okay, we've got a decision tree. We're, we're willing to go to this price point. Um, and if it goes beyond that, what's our next option? And then if that doesn't happen, what's our next option? So we have a, we have a, a pretty long list in terms of you know what our what our next options are. Um, also, what are ones that we're happy with in terms of if we get him or we get him or we get him, either is fine. And what are the players that we we really need them in that position and we're willing to just go a little bit further. So we have that decision tree and then we play it out in those mock auctions um, and we really test each other in terms of you know we become a bit of an irritant as well in terms of why don't you really force our hand here to make a decision and see if it's going to ruin our auction plan yeah and so we, we put ourselves under a bit of pressure there um and sometimes you muck it up you know you you go too far and then actually you can't buy this guy over here that you really needed so it's good fun trying to get those pieces of the puzzle together uh, mike uh, we watched this i watched this movie called moneyball and uh, you know that's the only reference that we have uh, as a film for data analytics and sports uh, how much of picking a squad from an auction is data and analytics versus you know the way you saw Devdutt Padikal it so happened that you were in the commentary box and you saw him play a shot and you said wow he has time yeah. otherwise you wouldn't be able to see someone like that if you weren't here so how do you balance that out yeah cricket's a lot harder than than in Moneyball because baseball because you know when you've got the minor leagues where you've got the leagues like the standard is always similar in its pockets the challenge for us is when you get data you're getting data from so many different competitions and competitions where um, you know the, the 36th team is significantly weaker than the top one so you've got to have context around performance um, and that's where our scouts play a big part as well because they actually they actually add um, context to the performance mm. so it's not a matter of just looking at at stats because stats in many instances lie um, you can get your stats to um, to help your decision making but they can also harm them if you don't understand the context yeah. so we spend a lot of time trying to marry up the numbers with with what they see and you know the, the numbers are they scoring runs against the best bowlers in the opposition yeah. are they scoring runs at the tough times um, you know because you know, runs are not always runs. <laughs> you know, that it's actually who and how and when you score them. Um, and those are the things that are that we look at. You know, if you're bowling, are you bowling the tough overs? Or are you just bowling during the middle period where it's easy so your stats are significantly better? You know, what are your what are your performances against the, the actual IPL players in that competition? Yeah. How do you compare the Nat West Blast with the Big Bash League or the you know, like they're all distinctly different. So, whereas Moneyball's a lot easier. So there's, 
you know, that's where we talk about that triangulating data. So we, we actually try and do some in-competition scouting where we, we view and we, we put some notes down. Um, we look at all the data, um, but we also get some eyes on the on the player as well and, and try and yeah, collate all that information. It seems like it. It seems like you're not just looking at your team, but you're also looking at the other teams in the league to see who picks what. Yeah, and I'm sure every other team does the same thing. It's just, the, I guess, the depth that you go into. Um, you know, we've got some a really good scouting group. We've got some different minds in our in our coaching group as well. Yeah. So people that look at things slightly differently. Um, and that's what you want in a coaching group. Um, in that scouting group, you don't want everybody having the same view yeah. and just agreeing because, um, you know, they should. Or they deem, they actually, no, I don't agree. I think that this team will go after this because of X, Y, Z. And for me, as long as somebody's put thought into it um, and they've got substance behind their their thinking, yeah. rather than just this random gut feel, for me, the gut feels, it, it, it's gone. Like it's, we need to have far more substance to our decision making than that. Um, gut feel is an element, sure, um, but it just helps triangulate our thinking and um, that's kind of the way we look to operate. How do you filter this information? I understand that you said that gut gut is just a small percentage but you need to substantiate what you're saying but also just filtering so many players looking at their strengths and then going up to them and communicating to them and saying this is your role this is what you're going to do you're the director of cricket operations so yep. it comes down to you finally yep i mean you always have to have a decision maker 100 yeah. percent. and i guess what I think is if, if I was an employee, I was a player, all I want is real clarity over expectation. So I spend an awful lot of time with our group coming up uh, with a, a game plan. This is our style of play that, that suits the, well, that gives us the best opportunity of success. And that's quite robust discussion in terms of what that is. That's not just one man's view, but it's a lot of gathering a lot of thoughts, senior players, coaches, um, and saying, look, for us to be successful in these conditions, this is what we think it looks like. And then you're breaking it down in terms of what are the roles that are defined around that. Yeah. So, so therefore, if a player uh, wants to play in that playing 11, it's pretty clear that these are the roles that you can fit. You can choose where you want to position yourself, but if you want to position yourself for a, an opening batting role, um, being in this role, these are the expectations. So this is the expectation around um, strike rates and, and averages and how you're going to attack certain players at certain times and how you're going to complement your mate at the other end and who's going to take the initiative. Those are the things that are really clear. So therefore, at the end of a game or a, a group of games, you can actually sit down and you can review against the expectations that you've all agreed on. Yeah. This is the way we, we've, we wanted you to play. This is what we've talked about. How have you gone? So, and for me, as long as you're trying to fulfill those roles for the team, it's not actually about your own individual numbers. It's have you, how have you gone about performing that role for the team to help them win the game? And for example, um, you know, AB de Villiers is, we've used him in a quite a specific role, which is a really difficult role. And it's a role that not many people are, are good at. Batting at five in a T20 game and, and controlling the last 10 innings of a game is really difficult. And it's actually, but it's far easier for a guy as good and as experienced as him than thinking that a young player is going to be able to come in and absorb all that pressure and understand the situation, being able to know when to pull the trigger in terms of going and being able to dominate certain bowlers. You've got to be a really special player. Um, so we're pretty clear around this is the role we want. Um, we know that no matter where we put ABD in the order, he will score runs, but how can he have the biggest impact over us winning games? And the belief of, you know, get your best players to face the most amount of balls, that's that's absolutely fine if if they don't get out. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Absolutely fine if they don't leave that responsibility up to somebody else. But for us it's all about the sum of the parts. How can we put a team together that is able to achieve a result for the team at the end of the day? Yeah. And that's what we spend time doing and and that's what players Love, they love that new challenge as well. You know, how can I take on that tough role and how can I have a really big impact? Um, and that big impact might be 20 off 12 balls to win the game. And that's massive, um, as opposed to getting 30 earlier on, which is at times when it potentially a little bit easier. So 
Um, therefore, when you review with them, it's far easier. You just review against their job description. You, you said something very interesting. You said you don't mind even if we lose, but if we play well, yeah. because you lose sometimes. What does that mean? How do you define that? Is it uh, how close a game is taken and say we lose off a last ball? Is that for you we played well? Or is it every ball that's bowled? I'm very curious to know how do you... Yeah, so it's in terms of our, you know, have we maximised the talent that we've got on that particular day? So, so from a batting point of view, have we all played our role? Um, in terms of, you know, we talk a lot about building partnerships, obviously absorbing pressure, um, you know, being able to to assess conditions. So have we played to the conditions? You know, we, we notice in these games here, you know, it, there are times where it's easier to bat and there are times where it's a lot harder. You know, when the ball gets softer, when yeah. conditions become harder. Yeah. Have we have we acknowledged that and have we adapted our game accordingly? Um, have we decided to, to attack the right bowlers at the right time? Um, you know, have we stayed in the game all the time in terms of running between the wickets and bringing that intensity? And same in the field, you know, have we, um, we're pretty clear in terms of the lines and the areas we want to bowl to certain players at certain grounds, have we executed that? Because if we execute that and it doesn't work and someone plays really well, then obviously we've got to adjust our plans. Um, if we haven't executed, then we can go, well, okay, this was our plan, we only executed 75% of the time, that's a work on for us. You know, but if you've done a lot of those things really well, and somebody's come and the opposition's come out and played like Superman and played really well, that's okay. It's just saying, look, well played and we'll need to maybe modify things a little bit, but we've actually played pretty well here. My next question's uh, again quite, it's somewhere in the same space, right? How much of the IPL or cricket in general is because of the practice and coaching versus the players and their instinct on the ground. What's the right order to put this in and what's more important? I think it, once again, it 100% goes back to the individual in terms of what it makes them click. So if you, you know, some players need more time to themselves. They need time to prepare mentally, to make sure they're in a good space, they're fresh. Um, they maybe just want to watch some video, uh, turn up to the game in a really positive state of mind they might not even hit balls for the, the day or two before yeah. because they're happy where they're at uh, and often it's a stage thing as well you know if, if a guy's in good form some players want to hit more balls when they're in good form some players want to hit less so rather than being too prescribed and saying look we all have to turn up and we all have to train for two and a half hours and we all have to bat for 40 minutes and well, that's just not going to work yeah. you know so if you can try and structure a, a practice schedule around what each individual needs and that's quite challenging yeah. because but but you only know that if you actually talk to the individual and find out what they need um, and sometimes it is a matter of actually challenging that guy too and saying you know what I'm actually not sure that is what you need have you thought about doing it this way and it's it's because sometimes the player once you get to know them sometimes they need that they need just a little reminder of, hey, actually, you, you need a break today. You don't need to go and hit another 200 balls. It's not actually going to help you. I would far rather you turn up tomorrow with a fresh mind. Um, and, you know, sometimes as a coach, you need to you need to do that. Very rarely do you even need to say, right, mate, you need to come to training because these guys genuinely want to train probably too much. Mike, it seems like a really stressful job because these are top teams that Every team has match winners. There's a very fine uh, line, right, between every team. What's, what, what is your process to give RCB or yourself as a coach the edge over the others? Yeah, I think it's it's the way we it's the way we structure our team in terms of those you know guys being really clear around their specific roles. I think that's a that's a little edge we can gain is if guys become really familiar in those roles and they become good at, at playing with certain people around them. They become really clear in terms of when they bowl and, and what types of matchups they have. Um, and also the fact that, you know, if you, um, you know, if you build trust in, in players, um, that they can have those honest conversations with each other as well. I think we've got a a group that a lot of the learning happens off the park 
just in the informal chats that the guys are having. So if you can help build that environment where it's a learning environment, but not always a, not a coaching environment, so that the, the subtle conversations that are happening all around us are probably the most valuable. Um, and they only happen when people aren't constantly worried about their own spot or, or worried about themselves. They're more willing to give to the team. And I think that's where you can gain an advantage. You know, that, that shared knowledge, um, you know, you sit around a room and, and you know, Virat's talking batting. Just in a very informal way to two or three guys, like it doesn't get any better than that. You know, AB's chatting to some, you know, two of our guys that bat at the back end talking about what he was thinking about when he was finishing this game or how he played this innings. And they'll pick out little parts that'll help their game. You know, Siraj talking about his, his wrist position with some of the younger guys coming through, you know, Uzi talking about getting in the battle and how he responds when he's under pressure. You know, these things, you know, Max is a unique character and, and he brings that freshness, but he's also highly skilled and, and he talks about, you know, when and why he's he takes the risks he does. You know, it's, it's not just a, they're, they're highly calculated. Um, and just having those, sharing those discussions with players in an informal way, grow the group. So I, I think that's probably a, a big part where you can, we can get that advantage. So can you tell the difference between somebody who's here to fend for himself versus fend for the team? Because every single player in this league wants to be on the field. It's very hard to get anyone to sit down and not play. Yeah. Uh, because this could change their life, you know, uh, you know, fortunes change, bank accounts change, careers change. Uh, and then you have to be the bad person who's telling someone to play or not play. This is my driver's license, my metro car, and this is my fan card! How do you do that, Mike? I mean, it must be really hard or, or or have you ever gone wrong with a decision where you've told someone, hey man, you're not playing, but three games later you had to put that person in and that person sort of just absolutely killed it and you went, what did I do? Have you ever done a mistake like that? Many times. Um, and as long as your decision making has got some substance behind it, I'm okay with that because you, you've, you can only make a decision at that point in time. And, um, you know, to be fair, we had, you know, we had a decision early on in this campaign where um, AB wasn't going to keep, you know, because of his situation. So we had to make a call over um, KS Bharat and Mohamed Azudin. And both are highly talented players, both are very good keeper bats, um, but they're quite different in terms of how they play and they've got different strengths and, and so forth. Um, and I think either player would have done really well. Um, but I guess we sat down and we had to decide what did we need in that particular role at that number three in terms of we want that that player um, who's able to bring some solidity, be a bit more experienced um, in terms of how they operate against spin. Um, from a keeping point of view, you know who, who we felt was the best keeper at the time, and that was a that was a decision that we you know we thought about a lot, um, and in the end it was. You know, it was straightforward, but it was really difficult because both of them have been performing so well. And those discussions are challenging because you, you're saying to a player, look, actually, you're playing really well and we know that you could do a good job, but at the moment we've decided to go down this particular path. And that's actually probably a good position to be in, is that it's rather than, I'm sorry, mate, you're playing rubbish, we can't pick you, this guy's way better. That's actually quite an easy conversation to have. Yeah. It's a terrible one, but but it's harder when you've got guys that are performing so well and you've got to deliver tough news. And you know that they will train the house down, they're waiting for that opportunity. Um, but we have to make a call. And, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but as long as there's some reasoning behind it. Um, and every time Azza turns up to training, he's you just have that honest conversation with him rather than lead him on and rather than give him, tell him that he needs to improve in this area or that area, that's a separate conversation in terms of how they can evolve their game. But be honest with them. Tell them, look, it actually was a tough decision <laughs> and we've decided to go this way. You might not agree with it, um, but this is the decision we've made. And stick with us, keep training hard, keep whatever, and good things will happen. There's a management that wants to win. 
there are players that we bump into who say they want to win what does it feel like to be the only guy in the middle who's like one game at a time we'll figure this out uh, you know if it doesn't happen you have a reason if it happens then you don't have to give reasons but you're literally sandwiched between two worlds that just want to win look don't get me wrong i'm a, a highly competitive person right. um i'm sure if you saw me play any sport yeah. um you know i'm i play to win and i always will yeah. and every single game we go into we try to win yeah but the longer you're in this game the more you realize if you are pining for the result then you actually forget about how you do it and you actually lose sight of the things that you can actually control so because the management want to win and because the players want to win and coaches want to win and doesn't mean that we can actually try any harder um our job is actually in many ways is to try and remove consequence because t20 cricket is about playing without fear and it's about taking the game on and and in the heat of the battle choosing that positive option um and choosing times to when to attack and if the whole time you're worried about what happens if this goes wrong um you will never make a decision and you you'll never make the right one so you know i i think that naturally people that haven't been in that situation will ride the highs and lows a lot more because they're so desperate to win they're not quite sure how to do it um they just have to win and you just lose sight of things you can actually control and you know hopefully i bring a little bit of um clarity of thought in terms of 100% we like if you ever think that we're not trying to win then you you missed the boat and if you think that we're happy with just playing well and not winning that's not the case either but there is a process to winning and my focus is working with the players and the team around making sure we've got that in place and then we give ourselves the best chance of winning um and that's you know we get so many great bits of advice on social media about geez the next game is really important and we've got to win that one yeah. it's like hey <laughs> you know of course we do like thanks for reminding us you know we know it's a pretty important game but it doesn't mean we're going to try harder it means we're going to try smarter and we're we're just going to you know try and prepare the best way we can and and play our best game because we know if we play our best game we give ourselves the best chance of winning um and we can just get consumed by stuff that's really not helpful is it a lot of pressure to deliver uh, is it a lot of pressure to deliver a championship oh i think everybody who's been at rcb everybody who's within this group has probably heard a million times that rcb hasn't won the ipl people people mock rcb about it you know in terms of they haven't won and whatever also made a number of finals you know and and they're very good side it gets misty but it gets lost mike but it Com- gets lost even though we made it to finals it gets lost gets lost it's like oh they they're no good they like rcb is a very good franchise who who will win the ipl at some stage you know i'm obviously very hopeful that it'll be this year but I, but all we can control is as i said is, is playing as well as we can at key times and if we do that we give ourselves the best chance i can't lay awake at night thinking geez i've got to win this otherwise i lose my job or i disappoint so many fans and whatever because that's actually not going to help like if it was going to if i was sort of a laid back complacent bloke who who didn't do my work and didn't really care and the fans obviously wanted a bit more then absolutely tell me to pull my socks up and work harder but i can assure you that everybody in this group um and the support staff and the playing group are desperate to do well and are desperate to play for RCB and be passionate about playing for RCB and that's something that I can control so that's where my focus will be you know it's like a movie nobody wants to make a bad movie you make the movie you work hard and then yeah. it just becomes a hit or it doesn't right um i i i always wonder if you had the opportunity to just say something to educate the audience that's watching and i don't want you to be preachy obviously but the best way to look at victory and defeat and maybe an incident that happened to you that that put this into perspective for you so clean i'm sure something's happened mike because the kind of the, the way you're talking it's not awakening that happens 
it's not last night right it's been a process that's followed for so many years how do you just look at victory and defeat and still be objective and say we got 70% things right we'll work on the 30% and move on to the next year again so i guess i've been fortunate i i, I took over atago when they were hadn't made a semi final for 20 years let alone a final let alone one of the things so in many ways when you when you're in a situation like that and same with new zealand you know when i took over new zealand we were you know, eighth ninth in the world whatever so at that point you're able to strip it back and say look how are we going to be able to maximize our talent you know so because and thankfully in those situations because we haven't performed everybody's willing to strip it back and and control the controllables and by doing that you actually in the end you get a really good result because you you focus on how we're going to do it and the process behind it rather than just the winning because if you if you last you're not just going to start winning next week you know and the same with like it actually there is a bit of a process so therefore when you get in a position to win you're far better equipped to do it and i guess that's given me some really good lessons along the way of and look it's boring and it, it is preachy you know focus on the process and not the outcome like it, it's people go oh, I don't really care you just got to win but you actually can't have one without the other and that's i think the so many times when you talk to boards or whatever it's actually quite a good lesson because you have to you have to show them that you have some method to your madness this is the method we have in a business way we want to get from here to here how are we going to do it rather than we lost here we just got to try harder work harder and we'll win over here it just doesn't work like that yeah. so the lesson i guess is over 20 years of coaching of going look let's strip it back let's let's work on how we can actually be a better team over time and then you've actually got some succession planning in place as well it's not just going to be a one off yeah and that's the way i look at things if i leave and we start losing next year um and have no structure whatever then i've done a terrible job you know and just looked after myself i'm trying to build something that's going to help us for years to come uh mike what would be uh say your advice to a mike who was 10 years old if you look back today and you had to talk to yourself yeah i i just say follow your dreams and i think so many of us get knocked down along the way you know we we do like no matter what you want to work you want to be a policeman you want to be a doctor you whatever you know there'll be so many people that tell you no nah, you should do this or do that i just reckon if you're really passionate about something no matter what it is and for me it was cricket and it was for me it was always playing cricket at the time but it was it was the game and i was so passionate about it that i you know i was this big i couldn't hit it off the square um but i still love the game and as i grew a little bit and got a little bit stronger i started to you know do a lot better in the game of cricket and and i i always had that belief um and i always had that passion to just just keep going and stay in the game and just give it everything and that's probably what i just hope that every 10 year old no matter what they're passionate in that they've got people around them that will keep supporting them and i was lucky enough to have people around me that kept supporting me and telling me to follow my dreams what would you want your legacy to be um just succession in terms of you know i think whenever i leave any any job having been there for a period of time um you know that that you've made enough of a contribution and you've you've left with really good people in place that they're able to carry on those good those good results um for me that's the that's the true sign of of you've actually done a good job while you're there is that you know the, the time after you leave um the team has even greater success than when you were there and i think that's probably a sign of you left things in a better place than when you when you arrived we're going to end with asking you the same question we started with how has the ipl changed your life it's just this made me appreciate the game the people the fans um made me appreciate that we're incredibly fortunate um to be in the position that we're in you know whether we're coaches whether we're whatever we are if we're involved in the game of cricket we're incredibly fortunate um and the IPL has made that happen for so many so many dreams um have been realized um and you just see the 
even an RCV, you just see the satisfaction in players' eyes when they've done something for the first time. You know, Shabazz hitting that six the other day out of the ground at Charger, you, you just see that little bit of belief in his eyes go, hey, I can actually do this. And those are the things that, um, yeah, they do change your life. You know, they change your life because you see people grow and develop and evolve and, uh, yeah, so we're lucky to be here. Thank you, Mike. Cheers, thank you. Good man. Thank you. Thank you. Listen to all the episodes of the RCB podcast on Spotify, Ghana, Amazon Prime Music and Apple Podcasts.